and uh, it's great. I believe it's going to be uh, times uh, that God's going to be moving upon the land. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know the future, but we know that He holds it all in His hands. Amen. And that we have God on our side. We have God to look to. He is our peace that passes all understanding. Uh, I, I'm, Connor's talking to me. I go down and, you know, last night. I, I'm not going to call you up here. Don't worry about that. And he goes, Dad, i got to tell you about the testimony. He goes, Dad, I'm just walking with God right now. And, you know, he goes, I get up in the morning, I read my Bible, and I pray, and I pray in the Spirit. And, and uh, I'm just, man, I'm just living, living for God. And uh, I said, wow, right on, man, that's good. And that he's never, he has his peace, he has his joy uh, upon him. Uh, through all of this, you know, that, that that's what God gives. We, we spend a little bit of time in the morning with the Lord, and that peace and that joy will just come upon every one of us. It's a great testimony that He has. And He goes, I just like living for God. And He goes, and it, it's fun. And I uh, says, yeah, right on, man. And uh, it's good. And so, and God is blessing him uh, with uh, jobs and schools and giving him vision and purpose and all these things as he seeks the Lord. Uh, it seems like the wisdom of God's just coming on him, and, and uh, he's having the joy of the Lord. He's walking really, truly in the joy of the Lord. And I, I uh, thank you, son, for being one of great son. You know, I appreciate that. He's an example to me, and I love it. Uh, it's, it's very, very good. I want to uh, go ahead and, and transition to our message this morning. Um, but may I pray, go ahead, with our hearts and our hands here. And Father, we thank you so much for the Word of God. We pray that it will just... Uh, bring uh, purpose within our lives today, and bring vision and joy, that will bring change and transition, uh, Lord, within every one of us, God. Let it bring blessing in your precious name. Amen. 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 So, I have a message this morning. Uh, I believe that harvest is coming. I believe that days of harvest are going to be upon us, and that God will use what the enemy tries to uh, split the land up, split nations up, split governments up, split churches up, cause the sheep to be scattered. God's going to bring gathering, and I believe that the time of harvest will be greater than we've ever seen in the days ahead, and that this virus God will use, and that God will determine in His plan and purpose all things that are good, because God can override any evil, any bad, any virus, any demonic threshold, any demonic thing that ever wants to come upon us, God is God and He rules over all. He's the creator of the universe. Right? And we look to Him in faith and we declare that His purpose and His plan will come to pass in the land, in America and in this world and in Mission Church and in this community. And I believe that. And I believe that God's going to bring a harvest into the church and we need to be ready and prepared for it and we need to know how to address it as a church. And when people start coming in, it's not going to be all on the pastor or Jill or anything on that like that. Every one of us here are going to be involved. You know, you say, wow, it's coming. People are coming. And we're going to have to know how to lead people to Christ. We're going to have to know how to teach people about how to walk with God. Because they're going to come. They're going to come looking for answers. And we need to have be ready with answers. Be ready in season. Be ready out of season. Have that joy of the Lord within my heart. That love of God that just wants to go out and just reach people. And I believe that they're going to be coming. And I pray that they come to all the churches. I really do. God is God. And He is going to uh, serve His purpose. And the enemy is not going to have His way. God's going to have His way in all this. But I want to talk about God's miraculous change. Some of you may have notes that I was able to put out there. God's miraculous change is what we're uh, talking about today. And we're going to look at uh, the Gospel of John uh, this morning. And uh, today we want to look at the, uh, one of eight miracles. John uh, records eight miracles in his Gospel. And we're going to look at one in particular today in John chapter 2. And that was the wedding feast of uh, Cana of Galilee when he turned water into wine. And we want to look at that. Now every miracle recorded that we see in the Bible, uh, it brings a revelation of God, or in the New Testament, it brings a revelation of Jesus Christ. It points to something. It's uh, only that the Word of God can do. Now we know that we have all the revelation that we'll ever have right here. 
That's revelation. That's all we'll ever have. God's revelation is right there in the written, the Logos, the Word of God. And today, we want illumination on revelation by inspiration. Correct? Is that right? So we need inspiration. That's why we come in here. We get worship. We want, we want inspiration to well up in, uh, inside of us. Then I have illumination. Uh, I, my spiritual eyes are open to the real revelation that's right here. You understand what I'm saying here? Okay, so we pray. We pray and we ask that. That's why we worship God. That's why we get we get it and say, Lord, I, I need illumination on your revelation by inspiration. And so we'll be talking about the very first miracle that Christ did. And we're going to learn something about Jesus through this miracle, turning water into a wine at the wedding feast of Cana of Galilee. And then let's turn to the first portion of Scripture in John uh, 20, uh, 30 to 31. There's something here about this, about miracles on this. And it says, And truly Jesus did uh, many miracles, uh, and did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. People come to us, are we going to be able to impart in them life in His name? Are we going to be able to tell them about what Jesus did? Because I believe personally, and I, I know a man, probably everybody in here is, we want signs and wonders to come back into the world and into the church. We need signs and wonders. Now the signs and wonders, and the miraculous, we need to see it. Now the miraculous gets people's attention, there's no doubt about that. But the miraculous, and John calls them signs. Why? They point to somebody. They point to a revelation of who God is. And that's what it's about. We get the wow factor, but really it's the sign factor. It points to Jesus, and that's what it's supposed to do. It's pointing to Jesus on that. So John has specific reason for recording specific miracles in his gospel. And I think it's interesting to know that for a period of 450 years, before Jesus came, there was no recorded miracles. None. 450 years. There was that intertestament period between the Old Testament and the New Testament of 400 years that took place there. Well, overall, a 400-year period. And the Gospel says that even John the Baptist did not perform miracles. The one of the great prophets. He did not perform miracles. The last recorded miracle was recorded in the book of Daniel when Daniel was uh, in the lion's den and the lion's mouths were shut and Daniel was delivered from the lion's den. That was the last recorded miracle that we see in the Old Testament 450 years later before Jesus does a, a miracle. And we're going to talk about that first miracle today that took place in John chapter 2. So John, he recorded eight miracles in his book, in his gospel, and he calls them signs and a lot of different words, but they point to something. A sign, I have this on here, a sign is a miracle that teaches a lesson. A sign is a miracle that teaches a lesson. What are we going to learn? What lesson are we going to learn this morning from John chapter 2 and the first miracle of Jesus? They were written not just to amaze, but they were written to instruct. What are we going to learn from the miracle of Jesus? It's wonderful. I've seen miracles before. I've seen miracles of healing that have taken place in people's lives. It's like, whoa, wow. But what did I learn from it? What are we going to learn from it? Because I believe God's going to bring miracles back into the church. We need to start talking about it. We start talking about it. We start believing it. We start believing it. We start talking about it. We start seeing it. And we need to see it. We need to see it. We need to see miracles. We do. Because it's God's nature. That's why. And God's nature never changes. The same God that was there in, in the New Testament is the same God that is here today. Nothing has changed about His nature. His nature is the same. He hasn't ceased anything of doing what He wants to do on that. Eight miracles. Number one, turning the water into wine in John chapter 2. Healing the nobleman's son in John chapter 4. Healing a, a man that had been sick for 38 years in John chapter 5. Feeding of the 5,000 in John 6. Jesus walking on water in John chapter 6. The blind man healed in John 9. Raising of Lazarus from the dead, John 11. A miraculous catching of 153 large fish 
in John 21. Every one of these miracles were a sign pointing to something that we could be instructed as a church for today and learn something from that. Amen? All right. Now let's turn to John chapter 2 for the first recorded miracle of Christ. John 2, uh, 1 through 11. <clears throat> I'm going to give you my thoughts on this. Now, let's just read the first portion of that. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Let's, let's stop right there. Third day, what does that mean? Personally, this is what I believe. I believe uh, that, and I'll get into this later on, I'll explain a little bit more about this, but the third day, what's the first day of the week? Sunday. Monday? Tuesday. Tuesday. So it took place on Tuesday. Keep that in your little sanctified noggin for right now because I'm going to address that a little bit later. A wedding in Cana of Galilee. Cana is a key uh, little village that took place. God chose this little village to perform the very first miracle. Now, uh, Cana of Galilee, if we're looking north, what would be, what about right here? Right north about Prox, Prox about right here. Uh, there, was, there was Nazareth, and then north of Nazareth, Nazareth was hill country, okay? Nazareth was, if we could relate it to the United States today, it would be like eastern Kentucky, West Virginia, that kind of a thing, and they had accents. They know, man, that, well, that boy's from, that northern boy's from, from northern Galilee, you know? And they could tell, they knew that because the accents were there. And so, Cana was even further up in the, the hill country. I've, I've had a change of, is my sound here good? Perfect, better? Yes. Cool, okay. All right, now Cana was right up there on the northern part of Galilee. And they traveled up there, and this is where this is taking place. This is key here in what we're talking about. Let's go ahead and continue reading here. And the mother of Jesus was there, okay? Now, and it says later in this chapter that the brothers of Jesus were there and his disciples. Jesus' brothers was James, Joseph, uh, Judah, and Simon. So we had four brothers that are recorded, and they're all with them, and the disciples, and I believe it was the 12 disciples. So we're, we got about 18 people that are there uh, that were added to this. Now, there's kind of this, uh, this carries a slight connotation with the language of, the, of, the, of what's talking about here, that Jesus and his disciples and his brothers, they were extra guests here. They were extra guests. And it was because of the connection of Jesus' mother that they were there. And I suppose, and I'm kind of reading into this, that Jesus' mother had a, a very close friend relationship, maybe possibly a, a family member, it's not recorded, but there was a close connection, and Jesus' mother was there for a purpose. Well, what is she treat? Because it's obvious, she's going from Nazareth up to Cana to go to a wedding. And now that's important, that took place there. And then Jesus and the disciples and his brothers were there because of her. That says that she was a woman of prominence at this time. It's obvious that she gave birth to the Son of God. But this is the only mention really of, of anything that we see of her in the Bible here, of, of what she does here. And it says, and it says here, verse 2, now Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. It's like there's that connotation that they were there because his mother was there. Now, can you say invited? invited. Who invited them? Who invited them? They were invited. Hey, Jesus, come on up to the wedding. There's an invitation. And when they ran out of wine, it says the disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Now this is of great importance. It's Tuesday here. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later on. They have no wine. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It's Tuesday. It's taking place here. They have no wine here. Let's go to the next verses here. And Jesus said to her, It says, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. And, uh, and so it goes on in verse uh, 6. Uh, verse 6 here. It says, Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. 
And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it had come from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. Uh, and he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the interior, the inferior, then the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. They did this in Cana. Cana would be like mayor. You know? And Jerusalem is Phoenix. Alright? Wouldn't it be a good place to start miracles? Right here and there? Why not? Why not us? Why, why, why not? Let's start believing. You know? Let's start believing for it. Why not? You know? And so, there's the first miracle, the first sign that took place here. And so, it says that, that they were manifested as glory and His disciples believed in Him. Or we could say, their faith was strengthened in Him. Their faith was strengthened in Him. Or their faith in Him was solidified. Their faith in Him was solidified. Now the question here, what was this first sign? Why did John record it? Because this first sign symbolizes what I believe in truth and truth here. Symbolizes conversion. Symbolizes transformation. Symbolizes change. Okay? Now, spiritual and moral change are the first things on the agenda for man when it comes to God dealing with humanity. These changes need to take place. That's what's going to happen to the church. These changes will take place. People's lives are going to be radically changed and transformed. With that in mind, let's look at the passage, and I want to share some thoughts today uh, about change and an inward change that takes place here. Uh, now, from this story of conversion of salvation, some truths that I believe that this sign meant to point to here. At first, the master, it's been important to know, the master of the feast did not know of the change, only the servants knew. Have you ever realized that the, the, the master of the feast did not know, the servants knew? When you came to Christ, was there a change that took place in your heart and life? You know, some people, they get radically changed. When they get saved, they get radically changed. And they don't do the things that they once used to do. Awesome. They've let that former life go. So I don't want any more to do with that former life in any way. And only those who experience conversion can understand it. Only those who experience conversion can understand it. A lot of our friends, they just don't get it when we get saved and we have a born again experience. They see and wonder and say, that person has changed. Something's different about that person. He's not doing what he used to do. He's not doing this and going there and doing all these things. Something has radically changed about what's going on. I don't understand it. But we understand it. Those who go to that conversion, there is a change. There's something that takes place on that. In fact, I saw him in the park the other day and he was reading his Bible. What's that all about? I used to know what he used to do. Now he's reading his Bible. And now he's going to church every Sunday and he's talking about Jesus to people out on the street. He's doing all these radical, crazy things. Wow. And it's like, and, and you're in France, I've seen France. What? Are you kidding me? That He's doing that? No way, man. That guy, are you kidding? Yeah, he's doing it. Yeah. What took place? A radical change. Something took place in that. There was something that changed within that person. Some of you have been misunderstood by your family. You got saved. You received Christ in your life. And mom and dad, brother and sister, what's wrong with you? We're talking about you, you know, talking to, hey, dad, have you seen Susie over here? She's weird. There's something here that's changed about it. But there's something inside that draw, that's drawn from the change as well. All right? You accept Christ. And they look at you and they just shake their heads. Ever have that experience, anybody? Man, that, that's, a, that's different. That person is so different. It's something you can't understand on the outside. You can only understand it from being born again. And that second thing here is, uh, let's note here, just the contents were changed, not the pots themselves. All right? This is a pot with something in here changed. 
All right? All right? 2 Corinthians 4, 7 is, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. It's a treasure within an earthen vessel. It's a pot. I'm a pot, but I have this treasure within me. There was a radical conversion that took place. Water into wine. When a person gets saved, gets converted, that part of them that changes is their spirit, not their body. It's not an outward change, it's an inward change that takes place. And if you're truly saved, there will be an inward change that takes place. There will be. There's no denying it. You'll start bearing fruit of the change that takes place on it. Let's look at John 3, 6, and 7. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Jesus said this. You must be born again. That which is flesh of the flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Jesus is saying, and that which is born again is not their flesh, but their spirit. My spirit becomes born again. Yes. They say, oh, Bob, this is a really simple stuff. I know. No, 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 no. We need to teach people about this. People are going to come in. Yes. And we're going to have to know what's going on. Because the greatest, the first miracle in the Bible took, takes place and symbolizes change in somebody's life. I still say that the greatest miracle is when somebody comes to Christ, yes. when they give their heart to Him. That change that takes place in them is a miracle that takes place. My DNA is getting changed. I'm going to get changed from the inside out. Yes. That's a miracle that takes place. I can get, uh, I can get he healed from maybe a cripple or a hand that's crippled up and I get healing. But not, if nothing takes place in my life, when is the greater miracle? I'll never forget being in Bible college one time where really we would go out on testimony in Aberdeen, South Dakota. And I was up in a Bible college in North Dakota up at that time. We would go down on the streets and we'd get speakers out and we'd start preaching on the streets. And we would go around handing out tracts and doing things like that. And people thought, man, look at those fools, man. This is absurd. This is weird. What are they doing? You know? And these guys come up to us and they were both pretty kind of lit. You could tell you could smell the liquor on their breath. And this one guy, he had his, his arm was all puffed out uh, with everything on here, on, on his arm. And I said, man, what happened to you? And he goes, oh, I got a wreck of my arm. I put up my arm and I went right through the windshield of my arm right here. It was all black and blue and puffed up. And I said, well, hey, can we pray for you? Oh, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. What have I got to lose? He says, can I just touch a little bit? Yeah, go ahead. He touches. And we prayed a really simple prayer. And we start talking to him about the Lord again. And I said, hey, look at your arm. He looks at it. It went back to normal. It's back to normal. And I go, shake it. He's shaking. I said, do you have any pain? No, no pain. No pain. But this is the point. Is if you want to see you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you want Him to come into your life, uh, I've got to think about that. Which was the greater miracle? Which would have been the greater miracle? Born again experience. Yeah. I don't know where His eternity is, course is right now. I only can pray to God that He can look back on what happened on that street in Aberdeen, South Dakota. And draw back from that and say, you know what, God touched me that night in a very powerful way. We would do that. We go around and see those things like that. On that, you say, oh, Bob, are you kidding me? No, I'm not kidding you. Those things happen. They're supposed to be happening. Let's be bold in our faith before God. Let's start talking about these things again. Start seeing these things again. We're in a day and an age right now where the world is opened up to the gospel. God's going to use it for good, and we're going to start seeing miracles Amen. in the land. We're going to start seeing it again. All right. Let's look at John 3, 6 through 7. Well, we said that. I'm sorry we said that. Um, Jesus is saying that when we're born again, it's not of the flesh, but of the spirit. You get your flesh and blood body from your parents, but which is born of the Holy Spirit is the human spirit. It's the person on the inside that gets changed. 2 Corinthians 5.17 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And all thing, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I'm a brand new man. All things 
have become new. That old, that old man is gone. There should be a radical change on the inside. Water should be changed into wine. The pot is there, but there's a radical change. There's a miraculous change that takes place within every one of us. Now, obviously, that is not outward. I got uh, saved, and I, and I looked the same on the outside. My hair never changed. I had the same color. Maybe as I'm older, it's a little bit changed. But uh, something definitely changed on the inside. I'm looking at a room full of people right now, but I'm looking at a room full of pots right now. You're all pots. I'm looking at a room full of pots right now. And there's new wine in the pots. Have you got the new wine in you? You got the new wine in you, amen. Yeah, yeah, it's new wine, amen. Yep, it is. Now there's a lot more that meets the eye here. You know, when, uh, a couple of Father's Day ago, my family gave me a Father's Day watch. And it's a Sangin watch. And it's out of the Sangin province of Afghanistan. And my son, Bobby, served over there in the Marine Corps. And, it, it, and some Marine, Marines that he knew over there, they got into the watchmaking business. And so now they make watches for the military, for Marines and Navy SEALs. And he wanted me to have one of these watches. And I thought, oh my goodness, what an honor to have one of these watches that they normally make for military guys and uh, all these, these sorts of things. So I wear my watch now and they have all these special hands, a little date change in here and all this goes on in here. Now with this, that you can see the outside and you can see the movement uh, with the hands and the calendar, but there's something on the inside that gives it expression. And that's when we become born again. There's a change inside of us. It gives it the expression that took place on that. Now, if you take the insides out, all the mechanisms in the watch are what? They're dead. If I see it all happening out here. But if I take that mechanism out from up in there, this watch is dead. It's dead. All right? James 2.26. It says, the body without the spirit is dead. The body without the spirit is dead. You know, when you die, your spirit leaves. It's gone. When the spirit leaves the body, the body is dead. When you take the spirit out of the body, the body is dead. There, Ephesians 2, 1 says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. When I, I'm dead in my trespasses and sins. When you talk to somebody, people come and say, Hey, bro, you need to get, you need to get saved. You need to get saved. You're dead in your sins. You're dead inside. Jesus can make you alive. There can be a radical miracle, a radical transformation that takes place. 1 Timothy 5, 6. But he or she who lives in pleasure is dead while he or she lives. We can live all the life that we want. We think we're having fun, but really we're dead inside. We're dead. John 2, 7. It says, Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them to the brim. Can you say to the brim? To the brim. To the brim. Good. All right. Third thing, they filled to the brim, not halfway. They obeyed with zeal. They obeyed with zeal. Fill them up. And they said, yeah, let's fill them up. Fill them right up to the top, not halfway. And that's the way it ought to be. There's a lot of half-hearted Christianity in the church today. When they work on God's house and the body of Christ and it's half-hearted, no, let's fill it to the brim. Yeah. Let's go all the way with God. I tell you what, there's a fulfillment in that. If you're halfway with God, you're half, if, if there's nothing in it. Let's not be half-full Christians. Let's be full-brim Christians. Yeah. Right? Believing to do it with all your heart. If, if it's preaching, preach with gusto. Preach in season, out of season. Give it all when you preach. If it's praying, pray with everything that you have. Pray mightily. Don't pray, God is good, God is great. We thank you for this food. No, pray it, man, like your life depends on it. Pray it. If you're studying God's Word, turn the Scriptures inside and out like your life depended on it. Because guess what? It does. It does. When you get into the Word of God, start studying as if your life depended on it. It really does. When you give, give liberally. Give to the brim. We're to serve the Lord with all of our hearts to the brim. The fourth thing uh, that I want to know here, or a thought here, uh, then they took wine to the master of the feast. They took wine to the master of the feast. And he calls the bridegroom and says, Hey, everybody, 
Uh, he sets out the good wine first, then the inferior wine last after everybody has a little bit drink. But you kept the good wine until now. You kept the good wine until now. Now the Christian life, I believe, is far better than it ever was before. Before I got saved, I, did, I dare not ever even want to go back to what I once was. Before I was a sinner. I know now no true joy and I know true peace now. That's before that. Now, I might have a slip and I might have a fall, but I guarantee you, I've got a God right here. Come on, let's get you back up. Let's get you going again. I'm not going to kick you when you're down. I'm not going to beat you up. I want you back up right now. That's the God you serve. Okay? I want you right back up. Did you ever notice Jesus didn't change uh, charge for the wine? He never charged for the wine. And you can't pay for your salvation. It's a free gift from God. There it is. It's free. It's free. You want it? It's free. God's giving it out for free. He doesn't charge. And it says that this miracle of transformation was accomplished by two things. This miracle of transformation was accomplished by two things. His words, the word of God, and by his servants. And you say, I am a servant. I am a servant. And I have the word of God in my mouth. Let's say that again. And I have the word of God in my mouth. Good. Good. Yeah. We can be loud in here. God likes loud. God likes full to the brim loud. All right. Get excited about God. Let's get excited. Let's get excited, church. We don't want no dead stick church. No, man, that's not for me. Now, listen, you know, if we spill over a little bit and, and on somebody's feet, uh, well, they can just forgive us, okay? All right. Yeah, sorry, stepped on your toes there. Oh man, I'm just serving God. I got a zeal for God. Hey, praise God. Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. All right. Now, by his word and by his servants, the Bible declares we are saved by the foolishness of preaching. That means you and me. God takes the foolish things. 1 Corinthians 121. It says, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of of a message preached to save those who believe. What is it? Through the foolishness of the message. That's crazy. That's crazy. And that foolishness, it's a really a Greek word, and it means uh, Maria. Not, not, not Maria, but Maria, okay? All right? And it means this. It means a, a silliness. It means an absurdity. It means it's weird. It's, uh, it's silly. What is this silly thing? Why, why are we called to preach? Why does God use preaching? The New Living Translation says this in this way. Uh, we bring that up there. The New Living Translation says, God in His wisdom saw to it that the world would never know Him through human wisdom. He has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. Isn't that powerful? God says it's not going to be by the wisdom of man. It's going to be how he says it's going to be, and it's going to be through preaching. And we are all preachers. Yes. We are all preachers. We are. We are. We're all preachers. Uh, that Romans 10, 14 says, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? Sure. Yeah. Well, I, I preach by my word. I believe, you know, I'll, I'll preach by my actions. Yeah, I get it. But they need to be told. Right? Amen. They need to be told. We need to tell people about Jesus. And you say, well, this is foolish and I feel foolish. God ordained it that way. God ordained it that way. And when they humble their hearts and they become like little children to be able to believe, God opens up their heart and their eyes. Their eyes will, will be opened to see what the gospel is. And what takes place? Water is changed into wine. Wow. A miracle That's takes awesome. place. A miracle takes place. Amen. Now the Bible says... We are born again through the incorruptible seed of the Word of God. That means I have to preach the Word of God. I'm saved by the incorruptible seed of the Word of God. That means it's got to get into me. 
I've got to give somebody the seed for them to get saved. I gotta tell them about what Jesus has done. Now I don't know how to do that. Do you have a testimony? All you have to say is this is what Jesus did for me. Some of you have powerful testimonies. Some of you have powerful testimonies in the sense that that God kept you your whole life. I got saved when I was like, well, I'm not talking about myself, but you can say that some people have a testimony they got saved when they're, you know, maybe six, seven years old. And they live for God their entire life. That's a testimony. Yes. Some people have been saved from, uh, that's the uttermost. Some people have been saved from the guttermost. Yeah. Man, you got a story. And a half. <laughs> and you tell somebody that story, and it gives them faith within their heart. And then you present it to them. Jesus can change your life. Jesus can save you. Is this the purpose, part of the purpose of the church? Absolutely. I think it's, it's a good major part of what we're about is to tell people about Jesus and, yes. and people that come in here and start getting saved. And we go out there and start seeing people saved yes. as well. Okay. You know, we need to plant the seed of the Word of God. It's His Word, but it involves His servants, and that's you and I. These servants were just mere men like you and I. Please listen up to what I'm having to say here. They were servants. They were servants. It doesn't talk about them, but I can guarantee you they were men who had faults, they had inconsistencies, and they had failings. And the servants filled it up to the brim. I'm a candidate. Yes. Inconsistencies, failings, but I'm a servant. Yes. But I'm a servant. Yet no one rejected the wine because of the weaknesses or the failings of the servants. The servants delivered it. The servants saw it taking place, but they didn't reject the wine. They drank the wine. Don't reject the good news or gospel because of the humanity of the vessel who served it to you. Don't reject the good news or gospel just because of the humanity of the vessel who served it to you. A lot of flawed vessels out there have delivered the power of the Word of God. A lot of people. I can tell you stories. I have friends that whose grandparents were great men of God. And they had some very flawed lives. But God used them. Let's not reject the wine because of the, the vessel or the pot. I think it's important. Let's not judge the pot. But let's take it. I'm a candidate for that. I'm a flawed servant. You know why God, you know why I stand up here? Because God picked up the bottom of the barrel. And maybe not really, but I like to keep it in perspective. You understand what I'm trying to say? I know, I know that I'm just the dust of the earth. And there's something in me that's, that is a precious treasure that God put inside of me and put inside of you. And you have the new wine now. And there's a world out there that needs the new wine. I'm just an earthen vessel. We are all just earthen vessels. We're all just pots. But the, the, the world needs that new wine. Don't reject the good news of gospel because of humanity. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4 5, you see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. I'm a servant for you for Jesus' sake. We don't preach about ourselves. Good. Why reject the meal of the new wine? Because your servant, the servant who served it, has flaws and is disappointing to you. Let's take it a step further here. Uh, there's a story here about uh, a man who was uh, out in the desert, and uh, the Sahara Desert, and he's dying of thirst. He has nothing. He's right on the verge of death. And he hears off on another sand dune a jeep that's coming along. This is sputtering jeep comes up over the hill, and there's this man driving the jeep, and he has um, he's all scuffy looking. He's been out in the sun. His, his face is all chapped, and he stinks. He's got a lot of stink on him. And he comes up on to this guy who's just on his. I mean, he's got minutes, maybe hours to live. And if he doesn't get any water, he's going to die. 
And he says, hey, I've got some water here, and I can haul you out of here. I can get you out of this place. The man in the desert says, no, man, you stink. I think I'll pass on the water. You hear what I'm saying here? You hear what I'm saying? Let's not reject it. You can die. I don't want any water from you. You look like a mess and you stink. You can go ahead and die because you will find a servant Christian and minister in the gospel who doesn't have some issues of faith. Amen. That's the truth. Yep. There's no perfect minister out there. You will not find one. That, that minister is in heaven right now. His name is Jesus. Amen. Okay? Amen. All right? Now they said to John the Baptist, man, he has a demon. And he won't drink with us. Now we don't like him because he won't drink with us. And then they said to Jesus, he has a demon because he drinks too much with us. <laughs> and he eats too much. He can't please everybody. Yeah. 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 Amen. Get it? Yeah. yeah. Ask me how I know. <laughs> do we open? Do we not? No, you can't open. No, you got to open. Amen. Praise God. All right. Maybe you've been turned off by some people. Don't judge the whole praying by a couple of clowns. Okay? All right. Okay. I think this passage, for the most part, deals with conversion, but there's more to it than this. I want to show you some other things on this passage in John here. Verse 5, it says, uh, and, as some of the most powerful words in the Bible, his mother said to his servants, "Who, whatever he says, you do it. That's the only command we see of Mary in the Bible, whatever he says. She pointed to Jesus. She didn't point to herself. She pointed to Jesus. Whatever he says, you do it. Okay? In the context of this passage, Jesus, he kindly rebuffs his mother. And he says, woman, verse 4, he says, what, what does your concern have to do with me? My time has not yet come. My time has not yet come. The phrase of a woman here is not derogatory in any way. Uh, we see that in the Bible, which is a, a term that was used with culturally within that. We see angels calling uh, a woman there, and it was not anything that was derogatory in, it, in this way. Jesus says, my time hasn't come. And I don't think Mary had observed any miracle of her son before this. As it says in Scripture, this was the first one. I don't think she grew up, or, or he didn't grow up in the house saying, oh, Jesus, I need, a, I need, another, I need an extra plate of food on him. On the table today, I've got guests coming over. Oh yeah, sure, mom, pop, you know, it's like that. No, it says that this was the first miracle. I don't think she ever saw Jesus give miracles before that. Okay, the Bible records that this is the first miracle that was here. Now, I think she had grown to know him well enough, having raised him and knowing where he came from and who he was, and she was pretty sure he was going to do something. He was a doer. He was a doer. Now, how's he going to do this? I don't know. But I have a lot of confidence in my oldest son, my oldest child right now. And here again are these powerful words. Whatever he says to you, do it. And whatever he says to you, don't write about it. Don't just pray about it. Don't have a panel discussion about it. Do it. Whatever. It, can you imagine the servants? That, they say, oh, we need to get together and talk about it. No, they immediately, they did it. They get it, okay? And Jesus tells the servants to do something ridiculous in verse 6 in the New Living Translation. It says, standing nearby were six stone water pots used for Jewish ceremonial washings. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Verse 7, it says, Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. That doesn't make sense, but when you know that God is about to bless you, God most normally issues a command. When God is about to bless you, He will issue a command. We see this over and over in the Bible. A command, obedience, blessing. Command of God, obedience to the command of God, blessing. That's exactly what took place here. Many times, miracles will follow. God most normally issues a command, and that command, when that command is obeyed, many times miracles will follow. I should have that on there. Yeah. Do we have that up there? All right. Think about this. Fill them with water. The servants could have said, water, did you hear that? 
They want us to fill these up with water. They're out of, uh, they're out of wine. This makes no sense. This is ridiculous. Now, that's about 150 gallons of water. You divide that out, that's about 2,400 pints of wine. That could fill out a lot of day. All right? 2,400 pints of wine. And, and so Jesus, come on, do you know, what, uh, do you know how long it will take us to fill these water pots? It will be hours. We don't know how many servants there were, but they filled them. Now, they were just about out of wine, or they were out of wine, so maybe they filled them six large pots here. But they, they do it. Why? Because they're servants. That's a true servant. Servants obey. <clears throat> when they hear God say it, I'm a servant, I obey. Blessing falls. Okay? They don't argue. They do it without hesitation. And Jesus now says in verse 8, Draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. And that's the second command. Fill it up. Take it out. And they obey two commands here that Jesus gives. Whatever he says to do, do it. Fill up the water pot. Now take it out. And they did it. Without hesitation, the servants did it. They obeyed. Okay? They don't argue. They do without hesitation. And so they, they, they draw it out. And personally, I think the water turned to wine as they handed it to the master of the feast. I believe that it was water. They saw it was water. And they took it out. And they said, give it to the master of the feast. Jesus said, do this. Give it to the master of the feast. And as they were giving it to him, that's when the miracle took place. That's when the miracle took place. The lesson here. It took faith, and sometimes we have to do the ridiculous before God will do the miraculous. Sometimes we have to do the ridiculous before God will do the miraculous. Remember when a guy by the name of Nahum the leper, and he was told by the prophet, go down and, and, and dip yourself in the Jordan River, this brown old dirty river. What's the matter? My, my river in Syria is better than this Jordan River. No, you got to go do it. And he balked at it. He wouldn't do it. Go down and do it. Dumps himself seven times. He's a leper. He comes up clean as anything. He obeyed a ridiculous command. And he come up with blessing. Wow. Wow. We must obey even at times when it makes no sense to do so. When you know that God has spoken to you. We must obey when it doesn't make any sense to do so. God will train you there. God, I need training in that area. God will train you in that area. Start off small, this little bit of thing here, being obedient here. Show you how to do it. Pretty soon you're up there filling up water pots. All right? Okay. Now, I want to say something. God does not toy with us or laugh at us at our expense. Our part is to obey and to do it zealously. Fill it to the brim. Fill it to the brim. And once we've obeyed, the miracle part is up to Him. I obey, the miracle part is up to God. Amen. Okay. All right. We fill and draw the water. He turns it into wine. We lower and draw the nets. He fills the nets with fish. We circle the city and we shout. He brings the walls down. Amen. Crazy stuff. Doesn't make sense, but we do it. The Bible says this. I do this. God says, wow, you're obeying my command. Blessing. Blessing. Awesome. Blessing. Amen? Amen. All right. Now, some of you know, um, some of you are thinking, man, 150 gallons of wine here? Does God want everyone drunk here? Is <laughs> about 150 gallons of wine? Uh, you know, and, and here's where we go back to the third day here. No, in, in, those, in the wedding days, uh, they weren't just a couple hours on a Sunday. They took place during a whole week. A wedding took a week. So the third day, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and they're out of wine. They've got four more days to go. All right? And so Jesus, now they're at, a, at a wedding in those days, it just wasn't that couple hours. Now this is the third day. Now Jesus, he comes along and he meets the need of an entire village. And he's Jehovah Jireh here. And we see this, the Lord my provider. No matter what kind of need he has, he can meet that need. Now it's interesting here. There's no indication they drank all the wine. Now this is what I personally think here. I'm kind of reading into this. Just go along with it. If you don't you think about it crazy, that's okay. That's all right. From Scripture, we know that God provides. He does it abundantly. Does he not? Yes. Whenever God provides, it's in his nature to give over. It's 
always abundance, always abundance, always abundance. You know, in, in uh, 2 Kings chapter 4, there's a story of a widow woman, and the, the prophet told her to get all the pots in the house and fill them up. Get the pots from the neighbors, fill them up, give them out. And the last part of the verse is there, and uh, the prophet tells her that we don't have any more. And, he's, and he goes, there's no more vessels. And so they all seasoned. And she came and told the man of God. And he said, go sell the oil. Pay off your debt. And you and your sons live on the rest. God just didn't pay off the debt. He gave them something to live on for the rest of their days. That's how God works. Not just this. Over an abundance. That's how God works. And just knowing how kind and gracious our God is, He's a God of abundance and overflow. Do you remember the feeding of the 5,000? Two fish and five loaves of bread. How many baskets did they take up afterwards? Twelve baskets. Over abundance. He could have had just food enough for 5,000 people or men. But He had over an abundance with it. That's how God works. Over an abundance. And, so, and he said, gather up the fragrance that remain. There were 12 baskets. When he provides, it's in abundance and in overflows. I believe Jesus, when he made this wine, it was in abundance more than enough. And it was given to an entire village. Now, my personal thoughts, you don't have to agree with, with this. So there was 150 ground, uh, gallons of wine, we know that. But he did this in a remote mountain village of Cana and Galilee. And these were poor people. These were poor mountain folks. These were what you could call, and I say this respectfully, these were hillbillies. They were the hillbillies of Galilee of Israel. They were. They, they absolutely were. He did this in this remote village, and who's ever heard of Cana? Who's ever heard of Cana? A small mountain village. Jesus was born in a small village in Bethlehem. He was raised in a small town village of Nazareth. Now he's in Cana, and the first miracle is taking place. Cana. Little place in the first miracle after 450 years, God fingers Cana of Galilee to do a miracle. Awesome. Can God finger Mayor yes. Arizona yes. to do a miracle? I believe He can. You believe? Yes. I believe. I believe too. There were no kings or dignitaries there that day. It was just a young couple. Now this is interesting. Getting back to the story here. Seven days of wedding. Tuesday, and they're out of wine. they got four days to go on this. And so there was a social stigma that if you, there was something here uh, with this. There was a great insult during a wedding. If you ran out of wine and you were not able to serve it for the entire week, you insulted the whole village. There was a stigma that would have been on this young couple, a bride uh, and a bridegroom, and that they would not outlive. It would have been years of stigma on their life. They did not fulfill an obligation during their wedding to have wine available. Now, some people would have thought it would have been a sign that their marriage would have been cursed. Well, they didn't have any wine. They're, they're, and, you know, people talk. They, they think these things. Oh, you didn't have this. God must be cursing you or something like that. And, and how, would they, how would you like that hanging over your head? It was literally a social disaster for them with a, with, a, with a degree of disgrace attached to that. And it would take them a long time to ever outlive that. Jesus met their needs. Now think about this. Jesus' mother comes to him. Now she must have been something. She was one of those moms. <laughs> Did it when I'm saying she was one of those moms that saw the need and saw, hey Jesus, well, I know what's going to happen here. You know what's going to happen here. They've run out of wine and they're going to have a social stigma. They're going to insult the entire village. It's just this young couple. And you know what? This is what's wonderful about God. God doesn't like to see people insult. Uh, God does not like to see people have that stigma upon them. You know, have you ever been there? Man, I, mean, I have me. And Jesus, I'm going to take care of that. I want to take care of that. Cana is interesting here. Jesus meets this need in Cana. And Cana is interesting. Cana was a part of the tribe of Asher. Did you know that? Who was Asher? Asher was one of the 12 sons of Jacob. And history, going back in history over a thousand years, you remember when Jacob blessed his 12 sons? 
They all get up there and he lays his hands on them and he blesses every one of them and he gives a prophetic word over every son. This is what he said over Asher in Genesis 29, 20. He says, bread from Asher shall be rich and he shall heal royal dainties. I believe that day on that Tuesday, that was, well, that was part of the fulfillment of that prophecy. That there were royal dainties from the kingdom of heaven, from the king himself, that came upon a little village in Galilee, Cana. That certainly happened on that remote day. And just maybe you are here today and watching, or if it's on here today, and you feel remote, and you're left out, and you feel overlooked, or you pass by on life, on the grand scheme of things, and you might think, nobody knows who I am, I'm lost. Let me tell you, my friend here, that God's delicacies fit for a king can happen to you. Asher wants to come upon you. The blessing of Asher. I want the blessing and blessing of Asher upon me. Maybe you need the blessing of Asher on your business. Maybe you need the blessing of Asher on your family. Maybe you need the blessing of Asher. I need the royal pinkies from the king himself to come upon me this day. And you say, let me, let me show you something. But first you need to do what this wedding couple did. What did they do? How did this all happen? They invited Jesus to the wedding. They invited Jesus to the wedding. Jesus was not a gate crasher. He comes into our lives and circumstances by invitation only. We have Jesus in by invitation only. If you want to experience the transformation that takes place on the inside, it changes the context of the pot. You have to invite him in. Invite him in. He won't force himself on you. God made us to have a free will, and there's no such thing as genuine love without a free will. We're not robots. God made us to have a free will to love. He gave us the ability to reject them if we want them, if we do or don't want them in our lives. I guarantee you, if you want God, if you don't want God in these 70 or 80 years of life, you won't have Him for eternity because you don't want to be bothered with Him. God wants to come into your life. It's time for an invitation. If you want Him to come into your life, you need to invite Him in. Can you invite Him in today? He wants to bring change. He wants to bring transformation. You say, well, Bob, I, I, I need that prayer a long time ago. Nothing happened. I, I don't know. It's a new day. It's a new day of faith. If you need Jesus in your life, He wants to come in. But you have to invite Him in. There's an invitation. God wants to bring change in your life. Maybe, maybe you have that salvation experience. You're a born again Christian, and you're saying, "Well, yeah, you know, I uh, I need further change to take place with me." We all stand up there. You need God's miraculous change within your life. Well, I don't feel anything special. I don't know. Invite Him in and see what happens. Invite Him. Let's see this and you say, man, I need God in my life today. Come in. I need, I need a, a, a fresh joy. I need fresh peace. I need fresh understanding of God. So, I need a freshness of the Lord. I just need, I need a blessing from God. Man, I'm weary from all this stuff that's going on. And I need a freshness of the Lord. Just to invite Him. Invite Him. Invite Jesus come into my life. I need, I need freshness, Lord. I need something here. Let's do that as we sing. Invite Him into your life this morning. Great opportunity to have something God do in your life right now. I need change in my life. I, maybe you need some new wine, more wine oil poured in. Maybe your your pot level is down and you need to bring it back up to the brim. Ask Him to do that for you this morning.